Hi everyone, this is Karen Whitaker from the League of American Bicyclists. Thanks for joining us today for this webinar on, on NHTSA and getting them to take bicyclists, fatalities and serious injuries safe uh, seriously as we move into the future. For those of you who've been following the League for a while, you know we've been working on car standards more and more through the years. And we think that there may be an opportunity now to break through. And we're going to ask for your help in doing that. So to start off, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Ken McLeod, who's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what NHTSA is and, um, and some of the work we've been doing over the years. I'll talk a little bit about trucks and side underwrite guards and then get into some of the actions we're going to ask you to take. So, uh, Ken? Thanks, Karen. Um, hopefully you are seeing my slides. Let's see the nice full screen slides. So I'm, I'm Ken McLeod. I'm the policy director for the League of American Bicyclists. Um, really excited to talk to you today about NHTSA and what they've been doing for vehicle safety and how they have not been taking bicyclist safety seriously. Um, so NHTSA is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, it's probably best to think of them as two agencies in one. Uh, most of their budget is tied up in highway traffic safety grants that are administered through state highway safety offices that more or less align to the safer people objective of the National Roadway Safety Strategy. Um, and then a smaller percentage of its, their budget is directed at safer vehicles, including recall authority standards and testing. And that's really where we're going to focus today. That's aligned with the safer vehicles objective of the National Roadway Safety Strategy. Um, and when you look at their budget, it's about $1.3 billion, but we're only about $300 million in the operations and research from the general fund that is directed at vehicle safety. Um, the two programs that we'll be primarily discussing in this webinar are the New Car Assessment Program, or NCAP, and the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards. Um, FMVSS. And, and those two budgets are, are quite a bit smaller, um, even out of that operations and research funding. So while these are programs that you might hear a lot about, the actual dollars that we spend on these programs is relatively low. So our work has really been focused primarily on the new car assessment program over the last decade. Um, NHTSA has not updated the new car assessment program with new tests uh, in the last decade, over a decade. Um, so in 2013, they proposed some updates. Um, in 2015 is really when we started getting involved and engaged around these issues. Um, so relatively few people commented in 2015. Uh, we provided more than 60% of comments out of 300 comments submitted. And our ask was for crash avoidance systems to be tested for bicycle safety. Um, we followed that up in 2018 when they had the next opportunity to comment at a public meeting. Again, we were a majority of commenters. Um, we're trying to make sure that they are aware that we care about this issue. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 2022, the next opportunity um, where NHTSA proposed updates to NCAP and started talking about a timeline that was required of them by Congress. Um, the interest in NCAP grew considerably, whereas in 2015, 300 commenters. Now there are more than 14,000 commenters, including more than 2,000 from the League and our supporters. Um, but they still didn't include bicycle uh, safety testing. Um, and then this year, right now, uh, they proposed pedestrian crashworthiness testing to be incorporated in the new car assessment program, um, but chose again not to include bicycle safety testing. So we have been consistent in asking for bicycle safety to be included. Um, and since 2015, we have been asking for testing specific to crash avoidance technology and providing a timeline for that inclusion. Um, and NHTSA has yet to include bicycle safety testing um, in any of its proposals or to specify a timeline for when they will include bicycle safety testing. So we are seeing a pattern of being uh, left out and not having our safety needs addressed by our National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, automatic emergency braking is kind of the, the big thing that we have been asking for repeatedly. Automatic emergency braking uses sensors in vehicles to detect 
objects and then automatically applies the brakes if a uh, collision is uh, detected, um, if they believe it is imminent based on their technology. Um, the last proposal that NHTSA did on this was last year. Um, they said that they hope to have a proposal in 2025 or beyond. Um, they have four criteria for including a test in the new car assessment program. And our comment to them focused on how bicyclist automatic emergency braking fulfilled each of those four criteria quite clearly. And this is a test that is not crazy new or innovative. Um, it is something that has been tested by the European equivalent of our new car assessment program since 2018. Um, and there are numerous scenarios tested in that. Now. So the opportunity here is really to address most bicyclist fatalities, um, which happen when a car is proceeding straight and uh, a bicyclist is hit from behind or a bicyclist is crossing and the car is proceeding straight. Those two scenarios account for more than 60% of bicyclist fatalities, um, although a fewer percentage of crashes. Um, and we have data from the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety talking about how those scenarios can be addressed, and then recent data from them showing that uh, the Subaru EyeSight system that was designed for just that uh, vehicle approaching from behind a bicyclist scenario was effective at reducing those crashes. So when a system is designed for a scenario, it is effective at reducing those crashes. And, and that's the type of safety benefit that we wanna see from more car manufacturers. And we want NHTSA to test and publicize so that American consumers can choose safer vehicles uh, for bicyclists. Um, when we compare what NHTSA has proposed to what is currently done um, by European NCAP, um, they are proposing fewer scenarios and they are proposing them sometime unspecified in the future. Um, so for pedestrian automatic emergency braking scenarios, uh, which it is great, absolutely great to see NHTSA include pedestrians in the new car assessment program for the first time ever um, in their proposal in 2022. They propose doing two scenarios where your NCAP already does four. Um, similarly, for bicyclists, uh, we're, we're currently at zero scenarios, and I believe your NCAP is now up to five, um, including uh, a test of anti-dooring technology. Um, which is not on NHTSA's radar yet. Um, and so we really aren't asking NHTSA to do anything technically challenging um, that is not done by other countries. Um, we are asking for them to do tests that uh, cars from US automakers like Tesla currently get tested on in Europe and currently do well on in Europe. Um, so the, the Tesla Model S got a nine out of nine for its cyclist AEB rating. Um, it's possible that the exact same technology is used in the United States and our Tesla Model S models are just as good as those in Europe. But since NHTSA doesn't do testing, we as consumers do not know. And, and that's kind of the whole issue with this testing program. It is meant to provide information to consumers and we are not uh, getting the information we need as consumers from NHTSA right now. Um, NHTSA asked, uh, because cyclist fatalities are increasing, when is it appropriate to adopt these tests? Uh, auto manufacturers responded to them and said, you know, we support harmonization with Euro NCAP. Um, we have included this technology in our vehicles, BMW says, as standard since 2017. Um, none of the automakers said this was unreasonable. None of the automakers said that this would be difficult to implement. All of them support including this test, and yet NHTSA does not seem to want to do these tests or commit to a timeline yet. Um, so we really need to break through to NHTSA that this is an easy thing to do um, that is you know, needed in our time of traffic safety crisis where bicyclist fatalities are at their highest level since in 45 years. Um, and this continued inaction is just unacceptable. 
And it's not just Euro NCAP, although I tend to talk about Euro NCAP a lot. So if we look at the new car assessment program of Japan or Korea or Australia and New Zealand, uh, sometimes called Australasia uh, or China, all of them have bicyclist AEV testing. Um, they've either implemented it or proposed it and will implement it soon. So we are just falling behind other countries and our US vehicles do not provide the same safety information to consumers that the rest of the world gets to enjoy. This year, uh, NHTSA took the step of doing a pedestrian crashworthiness proposal, which again is great. Um, this would be the second step where they include vulnerable road users in the new car assessment program, um, which has never before and currently does not provide any information on how safe vehicles are for people outside of vehicles. Um, so pedestrian crashworthiness has been around for a long time. Um, Euro NCAP first adopted it in, in 1997, um, 25, over 25 years ago. Um, it is present in China, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, there are only two major NCAPs that don't include it, one of which is the United States. Um, there's a very similar thing called UN Global Technical Regulation Number 9 that has been around since 2005 and is adopted by many more countries. Um, so it's great that NHTSA is finally catching up with the rest of the world on this. But again, they're choosing not to include cyclist safety in this proposal. Um, cyclist safety is less tested than pedestrian safety. Um, but your NCAP did incorporate cyclist head injury testing in 2023. Um, so NHTSA could draw upon uh, that leading testing to do the same thing in the United States. Um, and, and one of the, the things that we really zeroed in on in our comments to this comment period is that, uh, as I said before, there, there are four criteria for inclusion in uh, the new car assessment program. When they referenced those criteria in this comment period, they referenced the 2013 proposal for updates on the NCAP. And that says there must, it must be feasible to do an objective test. Over time, they've kind of walked that back to there must be an objective test. And now in 2023, in this proposal, they say there are not widely accepted objective test procedures for this, so they won't do it. And that kind of going from a, a test needs to be feasible to a test must be widely accepted goes from we are potentially able to lead on adopting new tests for the safety of bicyclists to we will be a perpetual follower um, for tests for the safety of bicyclists or others. Um, so it's, it's really disturbing to me to see us backpedaling on safety so much in a decade. Um, and these tests do exist. We could simply copy the homework of your NCAP, um, but we are choosing not to. Um, and so this, again, just kind of shows it, it, is, it is the citation that they chose to use is that it, it must be feasible to develop a performance-based objective test. And now they are saying it must not just be feasible. It must not just exist. It must be feasible, exist, and be widely accepted. Um, so they are creating new reasons to not address bicycle safety, uh, which I find very disturbing. This crashworthiness test that they are proposing um, is imperfect. Uh, it is a, a pass-fail rating. So we won't distinguish between a Toyota Camry that fails and a Toyota Tundra that fails. Our, our worst performing vehicles will not have their poor performance publicized, um, which I, I know many people are concerned about the growing size of large trucks and SUVs. And because this is a pass-fail proposal, uh, we won't know how poorly those largest trucks and SUVs perform. Um, very tall vehicles where that lower bumper height is more than about 20 inches will automatically fail. Um, based on what NHTSA has written, that'll be 
about 20% of vehicles have, have bumper heights of that height. Um, so there's a, a lot of vehicles where we just won't even know how poorly they do because they automatically do so poorly. Um, and failing vehicles, even if they are failing for these reasons, um, can still earn five stars under the rating uh, system. Um, and that's what will be displayed on car windows is, is that star rating, not whether or not they, they pass or fail this, this crash readiness testing. Um, so we did submit our own comment here, but there are also comments you can support from Salute America and America Walks um, that, that cover many of these issues very well. Um, and we do have other things to look forward to. So the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, provides that we will get a report on potential updates to hood and bumper standards um, by, the, by November of this year. Um, and NHTSA in the past has done testing of US versions of vehicles that are also sold in Europe and found that US vehicles perform worse in pedestrian safety testing. Um, and that's related to our Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard for bumpers. Um, NHTSA believes that that standard for bumpers will not preclude uh, vehicles also meeting this pass-fail testing that they now propose. Um, but I'm, I'm personally a little worried uh, that they are dismissive of that bumper standard as a barrier to safer vehicles. Um, and so be, before I, I hand it back to Karen, you know, why does NHTSA keep doing this? I don't have a solid answer for, you know, are they a broken agency that can't do tests well anymore? Are they a captured agency by the automakers who doesn't want to do things the automakers don't want them to do? even though automaker comments on vice versa AB say that they should do it. I, I don't know what is preventing them from taking action. Um, but if you, if you look at their budget specifically for the new car assessment program, uh, you can see that it has not kept up with inflation over time and sadly ha has not reached the levels of the last administration in this administration including a request that went down in the last year. Um, so I, I don't know what the disconnect is, um, but it's very frustrating. And I, I hope that we can break through and get them to you know, take action, uh, identify what's going on internally and, and address it. Because um, this, this pattern is, is just unacceptable um, when we have such a traffic safety crisis. Um, so with that, I think those are all my slides and I'll, I'll hand it back to Karen. All right, thanks, Ken. So I'm gonna talk about truck safety. Ooh, excuse me, I'm on the, gotta find the right screen here. Um, there we go, okay. I'm going to talk about truck safety. For those of you who were at the summit, um, a lot of this will look like review, but I'm going to get to the new stuff after a few slides. So one of the things we've gotten involved in more recently is, is truck safety. And we got involved because while only 4% of vehicles on the road are large trucks, 11% of bicyclist fatalities are from crashes with large trucks. So that's a um, a huge disparity. And another reason to get involved is we know at least part of the solution, and that's what's called side guards or lateral protective devices. So this, if you look at the picture on your right, this, um, the white object in between the two sets of wheels. Uh, and they can help stop a bicyclist or a pedestrian from getting uh, basically sucked under the under the truck and then crushed by the back wheels of a turning truck. I just wanna show you a couple of maps. This is looking at the percent of bicyclists and pedestrian fatalities that are caused from crashes with large trucks. And you can see the truck routes across east, west and um, north, south. And in mass, okay, yeah. And then when we look just at uh, bicyclist fatalities, Right, we can see that 
um, sorry, excuse me. You can see that it varies. And in Massachusetts, it's over 40%. So in these darker uh, purple states, it can get really high. And so when we, you know, in, in 2017, the Federal Motor Carriers Association at DOT saw these crashes, they were concerned about it, and um, they decided to do some research on it. A lot of that research was done by the USDOT Volpe Center, which is a research arm of USDOT. And now that we've, we know that there's really two common types of crash of side crashes where side guards can help. And the first one is when a truck is overtaking a cyclist, which is also thought of as when the cyclist loses control. And that's because when the truck goes past you, there's um, underneath the trailer, there's sort of a vacuum and that pulls you towards the truck. So I'm gonna show a series of slides on what happens um, in that scenario. The cyclist lives in these, but if you don't wanna watch them, I just wanted to give you a warning. So this is from a YouTube video and, and the commentary here is from an analyst who works on safety for, for large vehicles. So there we have the cyclist, um, the truck comes up on, it, on his right. And the first thing that happens is because the front of a truck is often so flat, it pushes air out of the way. So the first thing it does to you as a cyclist is it pushes you away from the truck. And in general, you're gonna to try to just um, pull back towards that because you're trying to stay upright. But then you enter that, that sort of vacuum or low pressure zone. So you can see here less than half a second from when the, the truck got equal with the bicyclist, the bicyclist is, uh, has already moved half of the distance towards the truck. And this we think probable contact with the rear axle. The bicyclist is trying to get out of the way. Um, and then with this trailer, there was a secondary low pressure zone. And now we're a little over a second. They're making contact with the truck. You can see that's the wheel, the outline of the wheel where you wanna stay away from. He does crash, but he was lucky. He, and, and walked, um, actually, well, he was carried out of the way, but he, he lived, Okay, but that's that pressure that we feel. And that's why they call it cyclists losing control because of that wind. Um, the other is when a truck makes a right or left turn into a cyclist. On this, we have these drawings. This is from Seven Hill Engineering. They're a firm that recreates accidents or crashes um, for, for legal cases. So this is what happens. The bicyclist hits the truck. That's not the part that kills you. It's when you fall in the wheel of the, in the path of the wheel. And then here's what a lateral protection device or a side guard can do. It basically just pushes you out of the way. You still crash, but you'll live, hopefully. So this is, and this is uh, just another view of it. Um, there have been, the UN has standards for side guards, but they're not, as low, um, they're not low enough to always keep the bicyclist from going under. So the recommendations from the US Volpe Center is to make sure that they're, um, that there's only 13.8 feet uh, inches in between the side guard and the road, but that's still higher than a lot of vehicles. So it still means that the vehicle can get um, over train tracks or anything like that. Here's an example of some of the research that uh, US Volpe does. It's a lot of how we do research with, with cars. And you can see without the side guard, the bicyclist falls into the path. With the side guard, it keeps you out from underneath the wheel. They also looked at, the, at a literature review. They found a number of studies. And what they found is that side guards um, can reduce bicyclist fatalities by 55 to 75% and they can reduce pedestrian crashes by 20 to 27%. And in, in the UK, they have made a law requiring side guards for most of their trucks. And what they found is that trucks with the side guards reduce bicyclist fatalities by a little over 60%. So you can see it's right in that range. So we have both real world um, 
and um, technical studies. And their conclusion was that, you know, that requiring side guides or really recommending side guides could make a difference. And so remember I said that the Federal Motor Carrier Association asked them to do that research. They did that research, but we've just learned recently through some reporting by ProPublica and Frontline that all that research didn't quite make it to the public. So in 2017, the Federal Motor Safe, it should be FMCSA, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Association. They saw the need for the report. They contracted Volpe to do it. But in 2018, the American Trucking Association got involved. They were lobbying on the report language. Um, you know, they had six months of meetings and eventually USDOT between NHTSA and the Federal Motor Carrier, they conceded and let the American Trucking Association review, offer edits to the report. Um, and the result was that uh, the final report took out any reference to a requirement and they took out basically 70 pages of the report, including a lot of that, that research data. And this is, um, I got permission from ProPublica to show you what that looks like. So on the left is what the original report looked like with suggestions and what you need to do to take advantage of the benefits of side guards. And on the right were the edits from the industry lobbyists and what finally made it into the report. So we saw huge changes on that. Um, and so that, just going back to that, that also gives us an opportunity to go back to this USDOT and say, look what happened on bicycle safety with trucks. You need to fix this. We need to make a difference on this. We also have that in the infrastructure bill, there was language requiring NHTSA to complete research on side underride guards and assess the cost benefit of it and to consider doing a regulation. Uh, just a quick aside, I'm using two different terms here, side underride guards and side guards. When we're talking about side underride guards, we're generally talking about something that is strong enough to stop a car from going under the truck to, so that the occupant's living space doesn't go under. The, the hood will, but not that. Um, a side guard, we're talking about what we were just talking about, um, the lateral protection device. It doesn't need to be as strong for a bicyclist, but it may need to be a little lower. So the thinking is, if you're gonna do one of these, why not do both, right? Why do anything that's only gonna save some people when you could, when it's basically, you can build the same thing to save everyone. So with the IIJA out, the NHTSA had to respond. And what they did recently is they released an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And this was rulemaking about whether or not we should require side guards or side underride guards on trucks. And the cost benefit analysis they did said, no, you know what, the cost is more than the benefit. Um, so we're not sure we even need to look into what a regulation or a rule would look like. And there's some real problems with this. The problem directly related to us as bicyclists is that they didn't include vulnerable road users. They didn't include pedestrian fatalities, bicyclist fatalities, um, other people outside of vehicles. They didn't include motorcyclists. But they also didn't include a number of things in car and truck crashes. So looking at the pictures on the bottom, they didn't include multi-vehicle crashes. They only included um, crashes where the, like the picture on the right, where the, the truck is, is standing still and you run the car into it at a 90 de degree angle. So they didn't include sort of side crashes, like the, the picture in the middle. And they, and they said that side guards only work up to 40 miles an hour because that's how they test it with the truck um, not moving and the car moving into it. But what we know on a, when this usually happens, both vehicles are moving. So they didn't look at speed differential instead of that. So there's a lot of things they left out and a lot of things we would like them to look at. So now the question is, what can we do? What can we as a community do to help change this? Well, first of all, I just wanna say, um, now is really the time. We've seen as frustrated as we are with NHTSA, and we will, um, we have seen some real changes and some 
genuine interest in changes in safety. So the US DOT as a whole has put out this national roadway safety strategy. They've where they've been really specific about wanting to address vulnerable road users. We've seen changes within FHWA that they're putting um, safety first. They're trying to, they're increasing funding available to do complete streets plans, saying that communities can do it all with federal funds. They're, you know, we're seeing uh, on the transit side, they're, they're trying to make it easier to get bike ped projects around transit. So we are seeing a lot of changes. We're just not, and we're even seeing changes at NHTSA. Like, like Ken said, we are seeing them finally starting to look at pedestrian automatic emergency braking, but we're not seeing the changes filter down to bicyclists. So what we want, in the long term, we really want a fundamental culture change at NHTSA. We want them to include bicyclists and motorcyclists and vulnerable road users in general in every car evaluation, right? We don't want to just looking at people inside of cars. We want them looking at, at people outside of cars. And when we first started talking to NHTSA, they were like, oh, you know, it's too expensive to test with bicyclists. We just, we can't afford get it, putting those mannequins on bikes. Well, that just should be an unacceptable answer. We, we need a fundamental change where they're testing for people in all modes. Our shorter term goal, um, is really to make sure that we're including that automatic emergency braking in NCAP as Ken talked about. And that we also, that they look at this side underride guard rule, look at that cost benefit analysis and really reevaluate, redo that before they decide, oh, we don't need a regulation on this because our fatalities and our injuries need to count. They need to be considered when they're looking at this. Now we get the, to the point of what we're asking from you. Or, sorry, before we get there, I want to tell you what we're doing, and then I'll tell you what we're going to ask you to do. What we're trying to do is really be in that conversation on vehicle safety. We've been, um, you know, we've been doing this for about five years, and we've been really focused on, um, on that automatic emergency braking. That's still our focus, but we're trying to get even more in the conversation, we're becoming better experts on it. Ken's been leading this work and has been speaking on, hey, this is this is how these car regulations affect bicyclists, but we wanna to continue to do more of that and we wanna be more proactive. We are all, also actually partner, partnering with industry. So um, we've worked on principles for testing bicyclists with car technologies, particularly looking at AV technologies. Um, we have some countries, some companies have signed on to that. We're working with companies that have advisory boards, particularly around connected infrastructure, uh, connected, yeah, uh, technology, so that your car can, so a car can sort of alert a driver, hey, there's a bicyclist on your right, be careful. Uh, so we're doing those things with industry too. And we also wanna build coalitions. And one of the newest partners that we've been working with um, and look forward to working with more in the future is the American Motorcyclists Association. Because in talks with them, their issues around motorcyclist AEB and looking at these side guard issues are the same. And so we want to work together with them. So what you can do, um, one, on the due tomorrow, if you have not taken action on the truck side under ride guard and sent a letter to NHTSA saying, uh, please include bicyclists and pedestrians and motorcyclist fatalities, when you're looking at cost benefit analysis, you still, ha you still have time, comments are due tomorrow. And um, the, the link is here and the link will be in the chat. Um, you know, looking at next week, we're gonna have another one up on cyclist AEB because as Ken said that they are looking at pedestrian AEB, they have a rule open for comments and we'll be putting out an action alert um, in the next week or so asking you to take action on that. But then we're also asking organizations and bike clubs to sign on to a letter to Secretary Buttigieg asking for these things, the uh, cyclists and motorcyclists, AEB, uh, vulnerable, including vulnerable road user fatalities and injuries any, in any research or rule on uh, the truck side under ride guards. And so we'll send around a link to the letter. We also have a sign up sheet and we're if you represent an organization or you're a member of a club, 
If you have the authority to sign your club or organization on, please do. If you don't, please get this into the hands of the person that does. Our goal is to get someone from all, all 50 states involved in this so that when we go to meet with the secretary, we can, we can say, this is a broad concern among a lot of us. The last time we were in talking to his staff, they said, well, who else wants this? You know, we want to see a list of people who support this. So this, this is how we're doing it. So we're asking your help to get, to get everyone on. So that's our ask, that's our presentation. And I will open it up to questions, please. You can put your questions in the chat. Um, and we can answer them there. So I see one already from Dave. Do you have sample language for the NHTSA comments due tomorrow? Yes. If you go to the link on the website or um, it's in the chat as well, it's like an action alert. You can, you can click it and put that language in, but you can also edit the language if you wanna make your own comments and that will send it directly to NHTSA. Okay, I got a correction on the report when I was talking about trucks with uh, side guards. It was London, not all of the UK, and they reported a 61% reduction. Let's see. All right. Any other questions? If you want to, you can just take yourself off mute. Have trailer manufacturers been contacted? So, I am going to recycle all the gas sets and stuff like that. We don't have a plan to have another computer or anything we need to get. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if that was for us. Um, have we? I have been in meetings with the truck industry. They know that we're. Um, that we're asking for this, but we haven't had a, a direct conversation with them. Um, Deborah, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, hi. And is there a particular reason that we're partnering with motorcycles? Um, one of the reasons to, part of, uh, to partner with motorcyclists is because their issues are very similar to ours in this situation. You know, very often we look at pedestrians because um, in a lot of cases where we're talking about speed on roadways or, uh, you know, off-road infrastructure, things like that, it makes a lot of sense there. But on this, it's the same situation. Motor motorcyclists are also very concerned with slipping under a, a truck. They also have been pushing for um, automatic emergency braking and have not gotten any, have not had a positive response from NHTSA. Um, I've got a, a question for Ken. Are there better EU regulations reflected in lower fatality rates there? Yes, uh, the United States has seen a dramatic rise in both pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities over the last decade. I think it's something like 45% since 2010 for bicyclists. Um, and during the same time period, the, the EU and its constituent countries have seen a decrease in bicyclist and pedestrian fatalities. Um, their traffic fatality rates per capita are usually between, I think like, two to five times less our traffic fatality per capita rates. Um, so they are significantly safer um, than us and they continue to get safer while we continue to get more dangerous. Um, if the United States had fatality rates per capita similar to them, we'd probably save 20,000 or more lives each year. Um, so it's, it's a, a big difference and it's an increasing difference. Okay, I have one more uh, question in the chat, and then I'll go to Steve. Got a question on on people for bikes and and what their instant what their position on, on this is. People for bikes is the trade association for the bike industry. 
they're supportive on on these asks that that we're making. So, uh, Steve. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to second what Ken said about Europe. I just got back from France, spent over a month there with my wife visiting family, and it's just amazing. Every single truck, and we're not just talking about 18 wheelers, which most of the testing uh, is being done on in this country, box trucks, uh, every one of them has side guards. They're not uh, side guards that protect against car crashes. They're specifically for vulnerable road users. But you just sense in the growth of bicycling in France and in Paris in particular is just astonishing. Uh, and even though the growth is there, the fatality statistics continue to sort of rest stable or go down. So in terms of millions of miles biked, uh, it's definitely a downward trend in Europe. I also just, if I could just mention, because uh, you, Karen, mentioned uh, uh, ProPublica, and some people on the webinar may not yet have seen the documentary that ProPublica and Frontline did, and uh, I'm sure you've probably seen that links from uh, labs newsletters, but if you haven't, I put the link in the chat. And if you really want to get riled up uh, emotionally about what NHTSA is all about, you really should look at this documentary. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, the crash data that Ken referred to in fatalities uh, is relying on FARS data FARS is the fatality assessment uh, system. I forget uh, exactly what it is, but um, every state has its own way of reporting crashes, and only 17 states provide uh, a box on a crash data report for the police to use. Uh, only 17 states include truck uh, underwrites. And so they're simply not reported. And the, the link to comment, uh, the uh, ANPRN says only 17 lives would be saved <laughs> by um, doing regulatory action requiring truck guards. And we know, uh, I've been working on this for a couple of years because this is how my daughter died, <laughs> um, that it's in the hundreds. Uh, and they know that, and they consciously lie about it. They ignore Congress. So uh, get your advocacy juices really stirred up, because this is big, big stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I'll say on the, uh, the side underride guards, it looks like this administration is using research and data that the last administration did. And so I think that's a, it's a fair ask that they stop and go back and look at the things that were missed. Because as Steve said, to say that side underride guards would only save 17 lives a year just belies what we see in the data. Um, I got a question on the sign-on letter. There's the, the sign-on letter and then there's a Google form for you to fill out and we'll use that to put the name of the organizations onto the letter. Um, so we also got a question on, um, is the, the rulemaking, if the rulemaking goals are not met, is there any plan for challenging the rulemaking, i.e. excluding, like if they don't meet, if they don't include vulnerable road users from the data? I think there are potential options to petition for rulemaking if this rulemaking completes without them going back and including vulnerable road users. Um, but we we haven't discussed that fully yet. Um, but it, it is an option um, that organizations can petition the government to do a rulemaking. So maybe. Yeah, if I can just second that, there is specifically an option to petition 
for rulemaking, the group I work with, Truck uh, Underwrite uh, Team, has done that in connection with other things, and they are required to respond to that. I also think there's, I'm not certain, I think there's even an appeal process. Um, uh, this is not a notice of uh, public of uh, public rulemaking. It's an advance notice, which only means that they're seeking uh, and offering to the public to, the opportunity to say yes, do rulemaking. And uh, as a result of what they're doing now, they could simply decide as it looks like they're going to do from how bad it is to not do any rulemaking. Um, it's, uh, it's a two-step process and this is the first step in the process. Right, and so we're hoping that building off of the ProPublica report, given the comments that we've gotten in, the comments that other folks are, are doing in, and Steve mentioned Team Underride, um, who's been working on this for years. We know that there's allies in Congress that are pushing on it. We're hoping that they'll take this back and redo that cost benefit analysis and then put out a notice of proposed rulemaking without the advanced in front of it, that they'll put out the real rulemaking. Also say- Congress is kind of that alternative to NHTSA being petitioned and, and choosing to do a rule. Congress can always direct it to do things. Um, NHTSA doesn't always meet those deadlines, but uh, Congress can still direct it. Yeah. So for those who, of you who are at the National Bike Summit, we did a letter in Congress um, asking the Appropriations Committee to, to direct NHTSA to include vulnerable road users in the data. Obviously, that didn't get into law before they put out this ruling, but if we can get it in, then they'll have to go back and redo that. Yeah, there's also, you can ask for a scientific review, which after the, um, the report that we were talking about that was edited so badly, after that was put out publicly, someone asked for a scientific review, and that at least allowed Volpe to put back up the data that they had done on site under ride guards. It didn't take down the bad report, but it put up the good data someplace else. Okay, we have a question uh, for you, Ken. Do you have any info about the Euro NCAP bicycle crash worthiness testing protocol? I know that it's new as of 2023. Yeah, so it's it's publicly available on, on their website. Um, it's it's kind of for for the the head crash testing. It's kind of buried. Um, so I, I can try to find the link quickly um, for their bicyclist AEB. Um, that's really easier to find, um, and I do believe that they're up to five scenarios now, um, including dooring, um, which is just not on our radar over here. At NHTSA. Um, but it's it's pretty exciting to me. Yeah, it's really amazing to see what Europe has done, what a lot of these Asian countries have done, and just shocking how far behind we are. All right, any additional questions? One, uh, if I could, just one thing I might add for people who are interested, uh, go into the Federal Register site. Uh, maybe I can find the link and read the comments coming from the trucking industry. It, it's There's hundreds of them. Uh, they've reached out, the uh, ATA, the Trucking Association, has reached out to drivers all over the country to uh, make comments and, uh, you know, they're full of falsehoods about getting hung up on railroad tracks and all kinds of things. But uh, it's interesting and just as a reminder to us, as uh, we're a sort of minority in all of this, to, 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 to be active, to get other people 
to do things because the other side is very organized on this and uh, is controlling what NHTSA does until we get the upper hand. But I will say that the comments that, are, that have been going in, they've been making a difference. I've heard from folks at NHTSA like, oh, wow, we've seen, we've seen these comments. You know, we, you know they are considering them. So it is important to get, um, to, to keep those coming. So if you can get, uh, they are due tomorrow, please do that. When we get to the action alert on the automatic emergency braking, we also really want help with that because we think that these two things could really help uh, reduce fatalities and serious injuries of people who are biking. And they're, you know, I was at an event with uh, Secretary Buttigieg recently, and he said, well, he said, he said the solutions are simple, but just because they're simple doesn't mean they're easy. And so that's where we are, and we really need your help pushing these simple solutions to get these changes. Um, Tim, you ruined my great ending, but we've got a question from Tim about can consumer reports be an ally in this testing? Consumer reports have definitely been an ally um, when we've looked at autonomous vehicles, but and I think in car testing in general, we can we can talk to them about this. I don't know. Ken, if we've had that conversation on cyclist AB. A little bit. Um, if if NHTSA is not going to act, then uh, one of the options that I, the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety and Consumer Reports have been involved in the past is a, a voluntary agreement with auto makers. So we've had some preliminary discussions about that as a fallback option if NHTSA continues to not do things. Um, yeah, they are asking truck drivers to make comments. If you look at the comments, um, there are a number of people. Uh, generally, I think they're uh, individual truck owners who are worried about the cost. One thing we know is that we've heard from companies like, for instance, Anheuser-Busch has a policy to get side guards on all their trucks. Um, and when I was talking to them, I was talking to them specifically about vulnerable road users. And so they were talking about specifically about the trucks that go into cities and worried about cyclists. So we do see, um, and they've been, Anheuser-Busch has been a leader on some of these safety concerns. So we do see some things in the, um, in the private sector and in the industry, you know, particular owners, which can be super helpful. Because we also know NHTSA does, in general, likes to work with industry as they move things forward. Um, I don't know about Amazon and Walmart. Um, but yes, those are definitely two companies we, we need to reach out to and look at the, lay these things on. We also know, as Ken mentioned on the Cyclist AEB, that a lot of the car companies are doing it, BMW's doing it. Um, is it Subaru that's testing and doing it there? A lot of them are doing it in Europe. It's, we just need to, to push NHTSA to require it for the rest. Well, we also know if I can, uh, we know that the trailer manufacturers themselves, uh, they have secretly, um, prepared uh, designs for side yards. Uh, and uh, they've told people I work with sort of privately that if the federal government requires this, we'll do it. But we don't want to be the first because uh, it will up the cost of our particular trailer and it will in terms of competition, it will be disadvantageous. So it's it's really an example of where there has to be federal action to require it for everyone. And then um, they have some actually pretty good patents that we've seen. So they know it can be done, despite yeah, and, what they say. And there's 10 or 11 cities and the state of Massachusetts that require side guards now. 
And so it just, that's another place where sometimes we see industry say we'd rather one federal regulation than a bunch of local ones. So we're pushing on all sides. We know that we have local partners and state partners looking at um, side guard laws. We're pushing at the national level. Sometimes you, we keep pushing and we'll meet in the middle somewhere. So, all right, with that, thanks everyone. Uh, please look at the letter. There's a sign on form for you to sign on to. We'll send something out once we have the action alert up. And we really uh, look forward to your help with this and we'll be back in touch with next steps. Thank you.